It's a pleasure to be back with, with you fine folks. I, I kind of feel like when I'm here, I'm preaching to the choir because you all know so much about what happened in the history of World War II. And I've also got my buddies back here from Silver Wings who've already heard this presentation, so I guess they're here just to make comments and kibitz and tell me when I screw up. But it's a privilege to talk about Curtis Emerson LeMay today. He was, without a doubt, America's greatest combat commander, and maybe the world's greatest combat commander. And this is kind of a tie-in to, to speeches that I make about what Tom Brokaw called America's greatest generation. And those are the folks that were bo born at the beginning of the past century, uh, survived the Great Depression, fought in World War II, and then came home to raise my generation of America. So the information from this PowerPoint presentation basically comes from these four books. Uh, Brent also just mentioned that we did the, uh, the Memphis Bell presentation last summer, and that is, uh, thanks to Mark, that's on a YouTube video if you want to watch it at some point. So we're talking primarily about Colonel Samay here, but there's two kind of sideline characters that go into this presentation, one being Haywood Possum Hansel, a Georgia Tech grad, and the other was uh, Frank Andrews, who was a generation ahead of the other two, but he played a pivotal part in uh, World War II also. So we look at LeMay, he was born in 1906. He had a very interesting childhood in that his his parents were hippies before hippies were, were existed. They wandered all over the country, even went to an Indian reservation out west, and they took their kids with them. And him, him he being the oldest born, uh, basically ended up raising his brothers and sisters. So he immediately found out that he was an engineer when for $25 he went out and bought an old Model T Ford and it was in not working order, and he restored it at 13, and then started to, uh, he sold it after that. Now, he was a poor boy, didn't have any military contacts. He really wanted to go to the military academy, but he could not get in. He just didn't have the pull. So instead, he went to the local Ohio State University. Now, he didn't have much to do while he was at Ohio State. He was in the Reserve Officer Training Corps. He took a full load of civil engineering studies. He raised his five brothers and sisters, and he worked eight hours a night in a foundry for $35 a week. Other than that, he didn't have a single thing to do. So he learned how to compartmentalize and, and was an incredible taskmaster. So as a pilot, he, after he graduated from ROTC, he took a commission, but at that point in time, with no war going on, there were no slots for training in the Army Air Corps. So he resigned his commission and went into the Ohio National Guard, and that's how he, how he became a pilot. Now his only experience starting out was one five-minute joyride. So he gets to Riverside, California for his pilot training, and he meets uh, Francis uh, uh, Griswold there. He called him Grizzy. And they stayed together through their entire military careers. He was a quick learner. He soloed in six hours. And he got his pilot wings right after the stock market crash. So now he and Grizzy are, are uh, second lieutenants in the U.S. Uh, Army Air Corps. And they go to a dance at the uh, officers club and they both have blind double dates. And uh, his date turned out to be Helen Maitland, a Michigan grad, uh, whose comment was, I'll take the fat one. <laughs> now, LeMay wasn't that fat, but Grizzy was like a bean pole. So, so two of them standing together, she, she wanted to take the fat one. And it worked out. Uh, he, she did all the talking and he did all the listening. That happens a lot, doesn't it? <clears throat> so now he decides that after he got in, 
there's still not a whole lot for him to do. And at this point in time, it took 17 years on average for a lieutenant to become a captain in the U.S. Army Air Corps, which was a whole lot of time. So at this point in time, Henry Ford wanted to run an airline with his Ford Tri-Motors. So initially, LeMay said that he would do that, but later on he backed out and he stayed with the U.S. Army Air Corps. In the meantime, uh, Haywood Possum Hansel uh, was part of the very first U.S. Army aerobatic team called the Men on the Flying Trapeze, which was set up by Claire Chenault of Flying Tiger fame. Now, one of the issues that uh, Possum had was that he got sick every time he did aer aer aerodynamics or aerobatics, so he was constantly cleaning out his cockpit after each performance. <clears throat> so they basically performed with a couple of other guys for this flying trapeze for four years. And then in 1936, Claire Chenault goes off to China to form the Flying Tigers, and he wants Possum Hansel to come with him. Well, Possum's already got a wife and a child by this time, and he says, no, I'm not going to go to China and, and be a volunteer uh, a mercenary, if you will. So this kind of broke up the uh, Chenault-Hansel uh, relationship, and they were really separated from that point on. Now, Hansel was really a much different individual than LeMay was, in that he was a little bit older, but he was fifth-generation Army, and he's kind of a a southern aristocrat, if you will, and he thought that his ideas were the only ones that were worth listening to and had no, uh, no thoughts about other people's views and opinions, which became very apparent during World War II. This is from Ira Eaker, not from me. So Hansel actually went to a military college in Swanee, Georgia, and during his senior year, he became captain of the Corps. Well, he had an appointment to the military academy, but something happened during that senior year and he was demoted. And he was so upset that he decided not to go into the military at all and instead went to Georgia Tech and studied engineering. In the meantime, LeMay has been sent off to navigator school. This is 1933. And his instructor there is a guy by the name of Harold Gaddy who was Wiley Post Navigator on his round the world tour uh, back in the 30s. So this guy knew more about navigation than anybody on the planet. And he's uh, LeMay's instructor. Now in 1934, they had a little experiment with the Army Air Corps where they tried to fly the uh, air mail. And uh, LeMay's route was from Greensboro, South, uh, North, South, Greensboro, North Carolina to uh, Richmond, Virginia, about 133 miles. And uh, during that time, they had 65 crashes and killed 12 pilots and quickly eliminated the idea of the U.S. Army Air Corps flying uh, the airmail. In June of 1934, he marries Helen. And uh, now he's sent off to Bombardier School at Langley and his mentor and instructor there is a guy uh, by the name of Lieutenant Colonel Robert Oles. You may recognize that name because he's the father of Robin Oles, who was the Vietnam War ace uh, of flying fighters in, in Vietnam. And uh, LeMay gave uh, Oles the credit for molding him as an officer and said that he learned more about how to conduct himself and how to be a military commander from Oles than anything else that he did. And this was his great gift. He had the ability, the ability to express thoughts so simply that even the dumbest person in the room had complete understanding. Now, if you can do that, you can be an incredible success in any endeavor in life that you choose. So in March of 1935, uh, MacArthur, who's the head of the, uh, the Army, the Army Chief of Staff, takes Frank Andrews, who's a lieutenant colonel, and bumps him two grades to brigadier general and makes him command of uh, Army, uh, Air Force headquarters. Now, Andrews was a little bit of a generation ahead of LeMay and Hansel. He was a West Point graduate of 06. And uh, one of the first things that came out after he became... Uh, 
head of the headquarters was that the Army had put out a bid for uh, a combination transport bomber. Uh, you notice I've got U.S. Army in big letters there and Air Force in little letters there because the Air Force was really under the thumb of the Army and they wanted the Air Force to support them and move troops around and strafe the ground and do all the kinds of things that the Air Force really didn't need to be doing. So the contract was awarded to this Douglas B-18 Bolo, uh, which was a vastly inferior design to the Boeing Model 299, the predecessor of the B-17. When, an engine, when a newspaper man saw it, he immediately called it a flying fortress and the name stuck from that point on. Now back at this time, the military didn't give any money to these contractors to build these prototypes. So Boeing pumped all of their money into the Model 299, thinking that that was going to be a success. And then on October 30th, 1935, their only prototype crashed. It killed the pilot and the co-pilot. The three guys in the back got out alive. But what they found was that there was an external gust lock put in the rear of the airplane, or the rudders in the elevator, and so they took off, and they could do that, but once they tried to climb, of course they couldn't, and they end up crashing. So uh, supposedly this is the uh, beginning of checklists in airplanes. Uh, the two people killed were Cowboy Towers, the Boeing test pilot, and Ployer Hill, who was the military pilot. But Andrews believed that the B-17 should not be scrapped, and he fought with the brass to, to get it approved, and he ended up getting 13 more prototypes to, uh, to test. Saved Boeing, so back when you loved Boeing before they have the problems that they have today, uh, you know, if you flew a, a Boeing a plane or you were a pilot with a Boeing plane, you can thank Frank Andrews for, for saving that company. So Andrews went to Olds and said, I'm going to be testing this B-17. I want your very, very best navigator. And his very best navigator was Colonel Samay. So the Army and the Air Force decided to have this joint exercise in 1937 where the Boeing B-17 would come out and drop water balloons on the battleship Utah, which was later sunk at Pearl Harbor. So naturally the Navy, being the, the clever people that they are, gave the Army the wrong coordinates for where the ship was to be. However, LeMay found them anyway. And then they went out to look for the Italian liner wrecks out in the Atlantic Ocean. And you can see those in the picture there, if you can see it, there's two B-17s flying past it, so he found them too. And then his greatest uh, accomplishment was that he took a B-17 from Washington, D.C. to Bogota, Colombia on this incredibly long uh, cross-country flight with obviously no GPS. They didn't even have a decent map. They, didn't, they might have known where the rivers were, but other than that, they had no clue. And he found that too. And then uh, he has his one and only child, Janie, in uh, 1939. So September 1st, 1939, when Hitler invaded Poland. And of course, George Marshall realized that the war was on the horizon, appointed Andrews to be the head of uh, all the training uh, for the Army Air Corps. In the meanwhile, uh, Colonel Samay goes to training and command school and says that he learned absolutely nothing. He said that Olds had already taught him everything he needed to know, and these clowns could not help out at all, and he was sticking to what he'd already been told. So as LeMay, the pilot, uh, when the first B-24s came out, he went to the factory in Wichita, and he took a B-24 up, and he did one circle of the airport, and then landed, having no training whatsoever, and then piled all the people into it and flew off to Wright-Patterson. So he picked up pretty quick on how to fly airplanes. Now, while everybody else was sitting around not getting promoted, he was. He was a, a cur lieutenant colonel by early 1942 when the war had just broken out. Meanwhile, uh, just after the, uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, 
the Americas had what they called the Arcadia Conference with Great Britain in Washington, D.C., and they started to lay out all the invasion plans for, for attacking uh, Europe from, from Great Britain. And Possum Hansel was in charge of putting all those uh, air bases over to, co to cover over 3,000 bombers. So he basically was a tremendous planner. He was a lousy combat leader, but he was a great planner. So in the summer of 42, you see Hap Arnold there with all these freshly minted pilots who didn't have any airplanes to fly. So basically, Hansel's put in head of the uh, Air Branch War Plans Division. He was a, a lover of the spotlight, whereas Curtis LeMay despised uh, any, any spotlight or anything like that. And Hansel was promoted to Brigadier General at that point. Now in June of 42, the very first attack on Europe occurs, and it's a, a guy by the name of Alfred Calbetter, who's a uh, Hoosier like I am, and he flew a lead mission on a B-24 from North Africa to the oil refineries in Ploesti, Romania. So uh, the 8th Air Force attack on France was not the first U.S. attack on, on Nazi Germany or Nazi-occupied areas. So then LeMay goes out to uh, Salt Lake City, and he had 48 pilots and four planes. Well, now his engineering skills fall back on him because he spends this entire time with a wrench in his hand fixing the airplanes so they can continue to train these, these bomber pilots uh, but that they were flying them 24 hours a day. At this point in time, he got his nickname Iron Ass from his... Uh, the, the kid, the guys that were uh, subject or underneath him. And then the other guys, the guys that, on top of him called him the diplomat because he was anything but a diplomat. <clears throat> at this point in time, they're at what is now Edwards Air Force Base in the summertime and it's uh, 120 degrees and they're sleeping in tents and training in the dirt and um, the mud and the dust, etc. Uh, Joe Preston, his XO, was one of the few B-17 pilots at that point in time with combat experience because he was in the Philippines uh, trying to chase off the Japanese after Pearl Harbor. Now, in October of 42, he contracts Bell's palsy, which uh, paralyzed the right side of his mouth. So from that point on, you almost never saw him without a cigarette or a cigar, rather, in, in his mouth because... He didn't want him to show with the, the drooping mouth, so to speak. Then it's off to England with the 8th Air Force in the fall of 1942. And he's put in charge of the 305th Bomb Group. And the first guy that he gets advice from is, is Frank Armstrong, who's already over there. Now, in July of 42, the 8th Air Force, you already all know this, but uh, they made their first attack on France. And uh, the leader of, of that group was Frank Armstrong, but he wasn't qualified to fly the plane yet, so a guy by the name of Paul Tibbetts flew it. I'm sure you all know who Paul Tibbetts was. And they had a six-plane attack element, and then they also had a six-plane diversionary element. Well, the diversionary element was led by Ira Eaker, of course, commander of the 8th Air Force, and he lost three of his six planes in his diversionary group. At that point in time, Hap Arnold told Ira Eaker that he wasn't going to be flying any more combat missions, or uh, diversionary or not. So now everything is uh, based around Hansel's plans for daylight precision bombing. Uh, and it, in the beginning, there was no fighter escort called for. That quickly changed. And primarily the reason for the daylight precision bombing, of course, was the Norden bomb site, which was the third most expensive uh, project of World War II. And uh, basically they said that this site could allow you to drop a bomb in a pickle barrel from 30,000 feet. Well, they didn't hit very many pickle barrels. They didn't even hit very many targets, but... Uh, the rotation of the Earth moved it, the target 20 feet before the bomb ever reached the ground. 
And there were 78 different settings on this bomb site, so it was extremely difficult for the bombardiers to uh, get exactly the right bearings on where they wanted to drop these bombs. And LeMay figured out how to get around that. The first thing that, that he did was go to what he called tight formation training, where he brought his B-17s into a, a cluster, so to speak. And he would fly in the top turret of the lead plane and figure out which pilot was in the wrong place at the wrong time and straighten them out immediately over the intercom. He changed the uh, three-plane element to a four-plane element, which he called the javelin down combat box, where he separated the planes by roughly 100 feet and had them fly very close together. This is sort of like Team Aeroshell does today, except he came up with it first. So his idea was to have lead groups and take the best people and give them the leadership job. So the best bombardier in the group was the lead bombardier and all the other planes, instead of trying to figure out what to do with their Norton bomb sites, bombed when the lead guy did. And he also had target folders uh, assigned to different groups. So when that target came up, that group was in the lead and they already knew everything that there was to know about that target. And all the other guys had to do was just follow what the first guys were doing. And then in his after action reports, he allowed anyone from a buck private to a bird colonel to say anything that they wanted to say about anybody in the mission and make constructive criticism to make the group better. And this proved to be very, very successful. Of course, the, the fighter escorts were there now, but it was just the uh, P-47 Thunderbolt and the uh, P-40 Warhawk, neither of which were particularly good fighter escort airplanes. The Germans, of course, had a uh, superior with the BF-109 and the Rocky Wolf uh, 190. Now, the P-51, P the, basically the fighter that kind of saved the war, or really won the war, didn't show up until long after this because the Army Air Corps was very concerned that it had a, a, a liquid-cooled engine and uh, they thought that it needed an air-cooled engine and they weren't convinced that these engines were going to hold up as it turned out of course they did and uh, the P-51 certainly helped win the war. So this is the distance that they could go. That, I don't know how well you can see that but Area 1 was a Warhawk uh, range, and Area 2 was a P-47, or 3 was a P-47, and 5, the P-51s could get pretty deep into, into the war zone. Now, the Germans preferred to attack the B-17s from the front. They were extremely hard to shoot down, but it wasn't so hard to kill the pilot and the co-pilot. So if they could, they'd come straight at them and, and try and nail the crew and not worry about the airplane. And they tried several different things to alleviate this problem. One of the things that they did, they sent what they called a YB-40 gunship, which was a B-17. They'd taken all the bombs off, and they put a bunch of extra uh, guns into it, thinking that they could use it as a, as a fighter escort, escort in a B-17. So there it is with all the guns. But what it turned out happening was that after they dropped the bombs, the B-17s coming back to England were much faster than the ones that still carrying all this armament. So they were straggling behind and they weren't able to provide any fighter escort or any kind of escort for those bombers coming back. So they quickly abandoned that project. And then they had one, now the uh, B-17, uh, I believe with the G model, they came out with a swiveling turret on the front of the ship. But before that, they didn't have that. They just had the 50 caliber machine guns sticking out the nose. So they tried this one experiment with six 50 caliber machine guns and a stationary turret. And they shot down uh, three FW-190s in a matter of seconds. Now why they didn't continue with this, I don't know, because it worked very, very well. Of course, the targets early in the war were the German uh, sub-pens along the, the French coast, and that uh, basically the Germans were absolutely destroying Allied shipping in the North Atlantic, so the prime target was the sub-bases. 
Here's the San Nazir sub pens, and you see a couple of U boats there. And that concrete that you see there at the top of the sub pen is 10 feet thick. Well, these 500 pound bombs that the uh, Air Force is dropping on these targets, they get the picture back and they say, oh, look, we obliterated all of this, but actually, the underneath in the pens themselves, they weren't really doing hardly any damage at all. Now, the British had a bomb that would uh, penetrate those concrete bunkers. They didn't actually use it. It was called a tall boy, and it was 12,000 pounds. They did use it once during D-Day when the German troops were trying to come uh, on the rail tracks from uh, wherever they were over towards Normandy. They dropped one of these tall boy bombs on top of a mountain pass that the train was going under and obliterated and kept the Germans from getting to Normandy. So it did serve its purpose. So in the meantime, LeMay, with all of his ideas about how to make his force better, started to hit the targets with far less uh, kills or injured and, and killed crews. So Lawrence Cooter, his commander, the wing commander, immediately adopted all of LeMay's ideas to his other bomb groups. And it proved very, very effective. Now, in early 1943, Cooter left for North Africa, and Hansel, uh, Possum Hansel replaces him as the commander of the first bomb wing. So his first trip was to San Nazir, and both of his wingmen and 10% of the group was shot down. On his next trip, his pilot was killed, his co-pilot was injured, but Hansel's not deterred. He's convinced that uh, daylight precision bombing from 30,000 feet is going to work fine. Here's three of his four command group, the, the uh, bomb group commanders. Now, Stanley Ray on the far left there, that was the, uh, the group that the Memphis Bell was in. They were based in Kimbleton. And then LeMay in the middle, and then, of course, Frank Armstrong we've talked about was, was also one of the group commanders under, under Hansel. Now, in January of 43, they have the Casablanca concert conference. You can see uh, George Marshall there behind FDR, and uh, Hap Arnold is over there on the, on the far left side of the picture, as you see it there. And they had a long discussion about daylight bombing at that point in time, because the British preferred to just go at night and just bomb anything that was there. It didn't matter if it was civilian or military or whatever, uh, because that's what the Germans did to them. So. At that point in time, they decided that one of the reasons they wanted to continue with the, the night bombing was that they could do it 24 hours a day and keep the Germans uh, under bay rather than just flying in, in the, uh, at nighttime. So in February of 43, they changed the rule where it's no longer fly till you die. Um, and they put in the 25 mission rule at that point in time. It later got expanded out as there was less Germans to, to, to shoot at them. But at that point, it was 25. And Ira Eaker and uh, the new commander of the European Theater of Operations, Frank Andrews, uh, basically set up that rule. So in February of 43, shortly after the rule was implemented, the very first 8th Air Force plane, which was B-24 hot stuff, completes its 25 missions. And then on, in February of 43, uh, Joe Preston, the XO for uh, LeMay, is flying a group of war correspondents on a mission to Wilmanshaven. And during that mission, uh, Robert Post, who was a correspondent for the New York Times and one of Edward R. Murrow's boys, uh, was killed. And next to him was Walter Conkright, who wasn't killed. So America's most trusted man survived that mission, and uh, Robert Post wasn't so lucky. Now, Winston Churchill gave uh, LeMay the Silver Star in March of 43, but all he really wanted to talk about was daylight precision bombing. And then the next month, he loses his major mentor, uh, Robert Oles. He passed away, he had a heart condition, and had a heart attack, and, and passed away at a relatively young age. In May of 43, uh, Hansel's ordered not to fly any more combat. I guess that uh, they were tired of him getting all his people shot up. And then 
on the fifth, excuse me, the fourth of May in 1943, hot stuff that B-24 that completed those 25 missions is going back on a war bond tour to the United States. Well, their trip was to go to Presswick, Scotland, that uh, yellow dot there on the left map. I don't know if you can see that or not. But they were to go there to refuel and then fly on to Iceland where they would refuel again and hopscotch their way back across the Atlantic. Well, they didn't stop in Presswick. They pressed it and just went straight on to Iceland without refueling. And uh, this is the crew with Robert Shannon, the, the, the captain of the... Uh, hot stuff, and at Mount, you can pronounce that if you're Norwegian, I guess, I can't. Anyway, they ran into a mountain, and uh, part of the problem was that, you know, it was in the fog, but we think that because they didn't refuel at Presswick, that they didn't have enough gas to wait around for the fog to lift and the fjords to get in to where the airfield was, so it was kind of like, well, we're either going to die out here in the Atlantic, or we got to make a move and try and land this sucker. And they think that uh, the person who was flying the plane was Lieutenant General Frank Andrews, the Joint Base Andrews in Washington is named for, where the Air Force One and, uh, and uh, Marine One are, are based. Uh, the rumor is that he was going to Washington to meet with, uh, with uh, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and get his fourth star and being named the head of Operation Overlord, the, the attack of Normandy. And there was another rumor that he was just going to Iceland to review troops, but he took every one of his aides with him, which he probably wouldn't have done if he was just going to go look at Iceland. So it kind of comes to the question of Eisenhower who. Uh, Eisenhower was initially the head of the European Theater of Operations, but the British kept stalling D-Day. So we decided to, uh, we decided, the Joint Chiefs uh, and Marshall decided to send uh, Eisenhower to North Africa and then to Sicily and then to Italy and plan all those invasions of all those coasts. And since the uh, Air Force was doing all the fighting in, in England, they would have an Air Force guy run the European, European theater of operations. So Eisenhower wasn't actually appointed until the January of the following year to be head of Overlord, so he may or may not have been the, the guy. In the meantime, uh, LeMay's made a wing commander, and he's given all replacement troops because he's such a great trainer. In uh, May of 42, he gets the British Distinguished Flying Cross from Air Marshal Arthur Harris, who somebody commented to me earlier was a whole lot like LeMay. He really was. And again, all he wanted to talk about was daylight precision bombing. Now, quick, he quickly becomes commander of the 3rd Air Division, and he's put in the Guinness Brewery estate called Elvedon Hall. So he goes from a mud hut to a mansion in about 27 days. It was, the reason he got promoted so fast was because General Nathan Bedford Forrest III was killed on his first flight as a combat pilot. And he was the grandson of Nathan Bedford Forrest, of course, the Confederate general and the founder of the Ku Klux Klan. So you can't make this stuff up, I'll tell you. In the meantime, Preston, his XO, sets up lead flight school for the entire wing, and all the stuff that they were doing as a bomb group is now transferred to, to the wing level, and uh, they're training him in that manner. One of the things that he had was what they call fog training, and of course, England was always socked in by the weather. Uh, but the ceiling was, was not, you know, it was a low ceiling, but it, the tops, the cloud tops were not that high. So LeMay figured out if he could lower the seat on the pilot and have him not be able to see over the top of the, of the cockpit and have the co-pilot sit up high, he could have them take off in formation and whatnot and climb at an exact heading and an exact rate of climb to an exact altitude, and they wouldn't run in each other in the time that it would take them to get to the top of the clouds. And it turned out to work quite well. However, on August 17, 1943, which everybody here probably recognizes as the bloodiest day of the 8th Air Force, uh, LeMay is leading uh, an attack on a Messerschmitt factory in Regensburg, and he was to fly from England to Regensburg, do his bombing, and then go on to North Africa. 
uh, but the flight air escort never took off because they were grounded by the fog, which LeMay's guys weren't. The second part of the attack was to a Swineford ball bearing factory uh, led by uh, Bob Williams, and they were to fly to Schweinfurt and then turn around and come back to England. However, he took off four hours late because of the fog. So by the time he got there, because he was late leaving, the Germans had a time to land, rearm, resupply, you know, the whole bit, get gas, and go out and blast the heck out of his group. Therefore, it was the bloodiest day. So at this point in time, Ira Eaker tells LeMay that he's not going to fly any more combat mission. He lost 60 planes, and 150 of those planes, after, in addition to those 60, were not flyable by the time they got to North Africa. In the meantime, in the summer of 43, the B-29 bomber comes out, which is the most expensive project of World War II, and Kenneth Wolfe is heading that up in Wichita. And it was a long-range bomber for the Pacific, and it was pressurized in that uh, the front part of the plane they had was pressurized, the middle, and then the tail gunner area, and of course the bombs and whatnot were not pressurized. But it required uh, 54 different modifications. Now, it would fly about two and a half times further than a B-17, and considerably faster. And it would hold two and a half times as many bombs. Harry Truman was the uh, head of the Senate Oversight Committee uh, on the B-17, and therefore uh, was responsible for all those improvements that they made. They had an extra crew on the uh, B-29. They had a radar operator. Of course, there was no radar uh, involved in a B-17. And in the aft compartment, the, the one gunner could actually control all the guns from his seat, or he could divert them off to the various gunners on the, each side of them. They had a tremendous amount of trouble with the engines on the B-17. They were a, a right uh, 3350, which was basically the, the B-17 engine with two rows of cylinders instead of one. And of course, in the Pacific heat, they caused a lot of overheating problems with these engines. Uh, in September, uh, LeMay gets his first star. And he's sent on a war bond tour, which he absolutely hates. So I told you that he hates the spotlight. And his uh, speechwriter was a guy by the name of uh, Cy Bartlett. He's shown there with Olivia de Havilland at, at some Hollywood thing. And he wrote the uh, screenplay for 12 O'Clock High, which Gregory Peck played Frank Armstrong, the guy you already heard about. That was his character in the movie 12 O'Clock High. And then they had the Cairo conference with FDR and Churchill met with uh, Chiang Kai-shek and Madame Chiang, who was head of nationalist China. And they were trying to figure out how to attack Japan. The Marianas hadn't been taken yet. So they wanted to, to figure out some way to uh, attack Japan through China. In the meantime, Jimmy Doolittle replaces Ira Eaker as commander of the 8th Air Force. And, of course, the, the P-51 is prominent by this point in time, as, as were a whole lot of B-17s and B-24s. So Doolittle changes all of Eaker's plans, and they start doing the night bombing rains with the British, and they're starting to bomb whatever, whatever happens to be there. And, of course, they had a lot more uh, B-17s to attack with. February of 44, Janie's five years old, and her mother asks her what she wants for her birthday. And she says, well, I want a bicycle, or I want a blue radio, or I want a baby sister. And so her mother said, well, the guys who build bicycles are off fighting the war. The guys who build radios, they're off fighting the war. And the guy who makes baby sisters is sure as hell fighting the war. So, so... He, he was almost out, but, but Curtis heard about it, and he had his engineers build Janie her blue radio, so she got her birthday present. In March, he becomes the youngest major general in the United States Army. At this point in time, there's a big fight over the B-29. Douglas MacArthur wants the B-29 so he can retake the Philippines and regain his dignity. 
And Admiral Nimitz wants the B-29s to soften up the islands in the South Pacific so his Marines and Navy can take those islands. And Hap Arnold wants them for basically Hansel's plan. And Hap Arnold won. And his plan was Operation Matterhorn. Now, why it's Operation Matterhorn, I don't know, because the Matterhorn is in between Italy and Switzerland, and they're going to fly over the Himalayas, over the hump, between India and China, in order to set up bases there to attack southern Japan. So, Kenneth Wolfe, who's been in charge of the B-29s all this time, uh, is basically put in charge of the 20th Air Force there in, in uh, India. So there they are, There's, that's the route that they would fly over the Himalayas. And they would use these C-47s and C-46s, and it took six runs of one uh, supply plane to fight one aircraft mission from China to southern Japan. So obviously this was not a very good way to run a war. Gene Autry, the singing cowboy that many of you remember, uh, was making $600,000 a year as a movie star and at this point in time. He gave it up for an E-7's pay to fly a, what they call a C-109 tanker, which was a B-24 that was outfitted with tanks to haul gasoline back and forth between India and China. And uh, <clears throat> so he, he later became almost one of the very richest men in Southern California. So he got his money anyway. And then the uh, Joint Chiefs realized that uh, Kenneth Wolfe was a great planner for the B-29, but he wasn't particularly great at, at combat. So LeMay got his job in the August. About this time, napalm had been developed at Harvard University. And napalm was a combination of jellified gasoline and magnesium. And if any of you were ever in Vietnam and you saw a Huey helicopter, which has a whole lot of magnesium parts, burn, you realize this magnesium was really nasty stuff uh, when it came to burning something up. So, Chiang Kai-shek is really upset because the U.S. is not helping him at all with his fight with the Japanese in China. So he wants them to, to bomb Hankow, which was a major Japanese uh, supply base. So they finally agreed to do it. And Hankow burned for three days after they dropped these bombs. Suddenly the light went off with uh, Hap Arnold and Norris Norstad and George Marshall and the, just what kind of a, of, a, of a thing that they had here with, the, with this incendiary bombing. In the meantime, LeMay gets help from uh, Mao Zedong, the communist leader of China who's fighting both the Japanese and nationalist China. But LeMay made a deal with him that if he would help save his downed pilots and get his people to bring them back to, to safety, uh, that he would give him medical supplies for his troops. So he, LeMay worked with everybody. And then in August uh, of 44, finally the islands of Saipan, Tinian, and Guam are captured. And now the B-29 can really go to work because it's a... Uh, 12 hours between uh, <clears throat> the Mariana Islands and Tokyo with Iwo Jima in the middle. Iwo Jima being a big problem because it wasn't big enough for a bomber base, but it had Japanese fighters on it. So every time the B-29s would fly out of the Marianas to go to Tokyo, they had to fight the, uh, the Japanese fighters both coming and going. So Possum Hansel, uh, becomes leader of the 21st Bomber Command. He was based in Guam. That's his airplane, Joseph J Jolton Josie there. And uh, Hansel was grounded in October of that year because he found out about the Manhattan Project. So they couldn't have him fly in any combat missions. In November, the very first Air Force plane after Jimmy Doolittle flies over Tokyo with Ralph Stakely and his crew of Tokyo Rose was the name of the plane. And they took 7,000 pictures of the Tokyo area so that we'd know what to attack. November of 44, Hansel's great plan for uh, bombing Tokyo comes in what they call Operation San Antonio 1. 
And Hansel was saved by a last-minute wind shift. The airfoil was not very large, and all those B-29s on them, when the wind shifted from one direction to the other, they couldn't turn the planes around fast enough to actually fight the mission, which proved to be very, very good because the reason of the wind shift was a typhoon out in the middle of the Pacific, that if those planes had taken off, they all would have been destroyed by the typhoon coming back to, to Tinian. So it was fortuitous for Hansel that, that that didn't happen on that day. Then at the end of November of 44, he does attack Tokyo with 111 B-29s from 30,000 feet. The leader of that uh, raid was Robert Morgan, the guy who flew the Memphis Bell, and Emmett Rosie O'Donnell, who was the, uh, the, the bomb commander, the, the bomb group commander. And O'Donnell did not want to fly the mission. He said, you're wasting your time bombing Tokyo from 30,000 feet. You're not going to hit anything. Uh, the reason that he said that was that there was kamikaze winds coming off of Mount Fuji right next to Tokyo. And if you were flying into the wind, there was like a 200 knot headwind, so the, the ground fire could wipe you out where you're just going to hang in there. And then if you're coming downwind, you're going so fast you couldn't hit anything. So it wasn't a very effective idea to, to bomb Tokyo from 30,000 feet. And then Isley Field uh, in Ontinian was attacked by fighters from Iwo Jima in November of uh, 44, and that greatly increased the desire to get rid of Japanese uh, fighter base on Iwo Jima. So the Joint Chiefs have now watched uh, Hansel and decided that he needs to be replaced. So Loris Norstad, who's uh, the assistant to to the commander of uh, the U.S. Army Air Force, Hap Arnold, comes to uh, Tinian and fires uh, Hansel and replaces him with LeMay. The first thing that LeMay did was instead of bombing from 30,000 feet, he bombed from under 6,000 feet. First nightline low-level bombing mission. And leader of that was none other than Robert Morgan again, uh, who led the attack. And they lost about 10% of their planes but while they were way over, uh, Tokyo Rose on a radio broadcast uh, was playing Smoke Gets In Your Eyes and It'll Be a Hot Time in the Old Town Tonight. And it certainly was. So they wiped out 17 square miles and 83,000 people on that one raid, more than they lost at Hiroshima. Okay, in March of 45, the Marines take Iwo Jima. So now they don't have to worry about the Japanese fighters anymore. And then in April, of course, FDR passes away at Warm Springs, Georgia. And Harry Truman, who's been vice president for all of three months and knows absolutely nothing about anything with the atomic bomb or anything else, is now the president. So LeMay is firebombing anything and everything. He bombed 66 cities in Japan and with a 1% casualty rate to the U.S. troops. So this uh, napalm turned out to be a, a, a big blessing for the United States. Uh, they would drop that pamphlet in the left-hand picture to the civilians before they went on their bombing raids. I don't know where those civilians were supposed to go, but anyway, they were warned it was coming. On the right-hand side, he's uh, basically briefing the press corps. So LeMay dropped so many incendiary bombs that uh, Admiral Nimitz ran out of bombs. The Navy was in charge of supplying all the supplies for the Air Force. So Nimitz comes up with the bright idea that they're about to a uh, invade Okinawa. And there's a strait in between the mainland and Okinawa called the Shimonoski Strait. So uh, then LeMay tells his crew on well, Nimitz's orders to drop mines in this straight in between the mainland and the, and the island. And they wiped out 80% of the Japanese shipping uh, and completely shut down supplies to Okinawa because of this. Then in June, the 509th c composite shows up at Tinian and LeMay is grounded because he now knows about the Manhattan Project and the atomic bomb. That little X, white X there in the lower right side of the picture is where the bomb pit was dug. These bombs are so big that you couldn't load them conventionally. You had to drive the B-29 over the top of the pit and then bring them up and, and put them into the bomb bay. 
the Marines took Okinawa, so now they're planning the invasion of Japan. It was estimated there would be three million U.S. casualties uh, on the invasion of Japan, which obviously nobody really wanted to do. Now, he's replaced, uh, LeMay's replaced by uh, Carl Spatz uh, in July of 45 as head of the Strategic Forces of the Pacific because he didn't have enough stars to hold that position. But Spatz just said, keep doing what you're doing and I'll run interference in Washington for you. In July, the Potsdam Conference, where Truman gets kind of his feet held to the fire, uh, along with Churchill, when they meet with Stalin to decide how they're going to break up Europe uh, after the defeat of Nazi Germany. And uh, he doesn't like anything that Stalin has to say. So he goes to Spatz and tells him that he wants to end this war before the Soviets can get involved in the invasion of Japan because it's only 500 miles from the extreme southeastern tip of Russia to Japan, and he knows they're going to be in there. And the same thing's going to happen as happened in Germany, and he didn't want that to happen. So there's the letter of authorization that Truman gave to Karl Spatz to drop the atomic bomb. And there is the bomb as it's being tested in White Sands, New Mexico. It's called Gadget. And then Paul Tibbetts uh, drops the first bomb from the Enola Gay, uh, uranium bomb called Little Boy. And that's the famous picture of the observation uh, building, if you will, the only thing still standing. And then on August the 9th, uh, Charles Sweeney in boxcar uh, drops a bomb on Nagasaki and Kokura gets lucky because Kokura was the primary target. So thank, I'm sure the citizens of Kokura were thrilled that they couldn't see the target. And this is the second bomb called Fat Man. It was much more, it was a plutonium bomb. It was a lot more, a lot, lot more powerful than, uh, <clears throat> than Little Boy was. There's uh, Sweeney and uh, Tibbetts shaking hands and, and Sweeney's crew. Now, one of the reasons they picked Hiroshima as a target was because there were no POWs in Hiroshima, but a B-24 by the name of Lonesome Lady who had a very, very graphic uh, nose art on her I don't know if you can see that or not, but that's a very nice looking derriere there. Anyway, uh, so they're flying, they're one of the last B-24s to get shot down during the war. And uh, they are shot down and they go to Hiroshima and Thomas Cartwright's the pilot. So they take him to Tokyo to, to interrogate him and leave the rest of the crew in Hiroshima. And the crew got killed and he didn't. So after that, Colonel Samay's on the cover of Time Magazine, not, not the bomb crews or uh, Paul Tibbetts or, or Sweeney, but actually LeMay. So the last mission of World War II, uh, Frank Armstrong, who of course led that first 8th or, Air Force eight commission, me, 8th Air Force mission uh, to France back at the beginning of the war, is given the job of bombing the oil fields at Ankito in extreme northern Japan. It's a 17-hour flight. But we don't really know who was first because Alfred uh, Calbearer also flew a mission on that very last day of the war. And it was his B-24 from North Africa that dropped the first bombs on Nazi-occupied uh, Europe. So you can argue about that for a while, but I don't really know what the answer is. Then the war ends with the signing of the surrender on the battleship Missouri. Uh, LeMay sets a world speed record flying his B-29 back home after the war. He's given his second DFC by Carl Spatz. And then he's put in charge of a research and development for the uh, Army Air Corps. And at that point in time, the Sabre jet had just come out and then they were trying bombers with combination of uh, piston and jet with the B-36. So Hansel retires at this point in time and gets a couple of different jobs. And, uh, but then he goes back into the Air Force briefly during the Korean War to help with planning of that. And then in 55, he's completely out of the service. Uh, Strategic Air Command is found in March of 46, before the U.S. Air Force became the U.S. Air Force. I don't know how they worked that, but anyway, SAC, SAC was an entity before the U.S. Army Air Corps changed their name to the U.S. Air Force. 
And LeMay got his third star and is given command of Air Force Europe. And he's uh, living in a champagne mansion. This is the uh, Henkel uh, champagne mansion he gets to live in. So he's really in, in, in high cotton there with, with his living quarters. So he and uh, Arthur Trudeau, who was the head of the armor division in, uh, in uh, Germany, decide that they should really run off the Russians at this point in time because Russia doesn't have the bomb yet, and we do. So they make this plan that LeMay's going to bomb all the, the uh, German airfields, and Trudeau's, Trudeau is going to take his tanks right up the Autobahn, and they're going to capture uh, East Berlin and take over and run the Russians out of there. And, of course, the Joint Chiefs of Staff didn't do it. It would be very interesting to know what would have happened today if they had. So in 48, the Berlin Airlift, also called LeMay's Coal and Feed Company, they dropped a lot of coal, or actually brought a lot of coal into Berlin because Berlin was actually inside of the uh, Soviet sector of, of Germany. It was a weird way to break it up, but anyway, that's what it was. So you got uh, East Germany over here and you got Berlin in the middle of East Germany with the western part of West Berlin being uh, the Allied forces. So this shows some of the C-47s coming into Tempelhof Airfield in West Berlin. You can see that truck offloading the various supplies to, to feed these starving West Germans. There's the candy bomber. And then in 48, LeMay takes over the Strategic Air Command in Omaha, Nebraska, which is in total shambles at this point in time. So he, along with these three key men, uh, Power and Montgomery and Kisner, decide uh, that they're going to reinvent SAC and make it the force that it became. And in 48, when LeMay took over for SAC, they only had 50 atomic bombs, only 58 planes capable of flying that, those bombs. And the bombs weren't even on the fields. They were being held by the Atomic Energy Commission. Well, in 1949, Russia got the bomb and everything changed overnight. All of a sudden, he's got 1,000 airplanes and 65,000 people, and the bombs are now stored on the air bases. And uh, he is, in his infinite wisdom, he put checklists into anything and everything and reduced the airplane accidents by 87%. And he had the best living conditions of anybody in the military. I remember being in Vietnam and having to go back to uh, Benoit Air Base and being impressed with all the air conditioning and the movie theaters and the canteens and uh, the barracks and all the things that the Air Force had that we were living in a mud hut. And, you know, air conditioning, what is that? Take a cold shower if you want to cool off. So in July of 1950, the Korean War comes on and Harry Truman makes the decision he's not going to use any nukes. But what he does use is incendiaries, and he ended up killing off 10 to 15 percent of the North Korean population with these incendiaries. So is it any wonder that they hate us to this day? So in October of 51, he gets his fourth star. He's the youngest four-star general in the U.S. Army since U.S. Grant during the Civil War. In 55, the propaganda movie The Strategic Air Command comes out with Jimmy Stewart, who's a decorated B-24 pilot, uh, and June Allison is, is uh, in that movie. And this was the movie that I saw that said, gee, I want to be a pilot. There's uh, Jimmy Stewart getting the Croix de Guerre from some French dude, and June Allison is lighting LeMay's cigar. And there's uh, Patricia lighting a cigar. The cigar was everywhere. Arthur Godfrey was one of his really good buddies. And he had a one-hour television show once a week uh, on CBS, and he would promote the Strategic Air Command on his TV show. The uh, famous uh, guard shack in incident, and I, I wasn't there, I don't know if it's true or not, but supposedly, you know, LeMay had all these surprise inspections of anything and everything all the time, and he had his driver run through the guard shack at the, uh, the base entrance or whatever, and the uh, guard put a bullet through the back window of the, the uh, command car. And so LeMay told his driver to turn around. He came back and he ripped the stripes off of the, uh, 
the guard there and he said, I'm not demoting you because you shot at me. I'm demoting you because you missed. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's true, but that makes a great uh, LeMay story. So in 55, the first B-52s start to arrive, and the SAC gets 17% of the defense budget. So the Russians have really put the fear of God in the United States at this point in time, and they want to fight them off in any way, shape that they can. Uh, Thomas White becomes the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in 57, and he turns the Air Force over to LeMay and tells him to run it. Also in 57, he's named the Outdoorsman of the Year by the National Rifle Association. And he still had time for fun. He, would, uh, he was big on sports cars and go-karts and things like that. And of course, air bases had a lot of room. So they would conduct air, uh, basically races and go-karts and things like that around the air base. And he also flew fighters and did whatever else he wanted because he was running everything. January 20th of 61, JFK becomes president. I don't know if you can see it, but in that picture on the right, LeMay is standing there with some of the Kennedy sisters. And uh, McNamara, Robert McNamara, the president of Ford Motor Company, is made defense secretary. And he brings in a bunch of his guys and these uh, whiz kids from the RAND Corporation, which was a Washington think tank to run the Defense Department, and they really did a horrible job. Uh, in June of 61, much to the surprise of everyone, LeMay is named the Air Force Chief of Staff. And he gets his picture on the cover of Stag Magazine. <laughs> so here he is with JFK in 62. LeMay said that JFK had no idea what kind of military power that he really had. And of course, one that we all remember, Maybe the little kid doesn't remember it, but we all remember is the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. And there's a cartoon of Khrushchev and Kennedy fighting over, over Cuba. Now, LeMay, of course, in his infinite wisdom, wanted JFK to basically attack Cuba and take it. And, of course, JFK was a bit of a pacifist, so he decided not to listen to LeMay's advice. And... Of course, the standoff worked all right, but don't tell them what would have happened if we'd actually invaded. Uh, at that point in time, McNamara and Maxwell Taylor, uh, who was head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, were kind of running things. LeMay wanted to put armed nuclear missiles on uh, in the Skybolt Ballistic Missile Project on Air Force planes, but the Joint Chiefs shot him down and gave those ballistic missiles to the submarines. So. They were basically the Navy got those missiles and the Air Force did not. This is kind of the straw that broke the, the camel's back, so to speak, or close to it. The Valkyrie Mach 3 nuclear bomber. This was uh, LeMay's baby and it was uh, a, a great airplane. But uh, the General Dynamics F-11 Aardvark, which the pilots called a switchblade Edsel, uh, was chosen for, for, for that uh, contract, and it was a, a very inefficient airplane that didn't work near as well as the North American plane did, and it cost a whole lot more money than the North American airplane did, but it was manufactured in Texas, and JFK was president, so end of conversation. He went to Vietnam, as did a lot of us, so on November 1st, 1964, LeMay and his staff get approval from the Joint Chiefs to bomb 94 strategic North Vietnamese targets. Would have completely changed the war. Johnson and McNamara said, no, didn't do it. So LeMay retires from the, from the Air Force uh, in uh, January 31st of 1965 having served 13 years as the longest serving fourth star general in the history of the army. In the meantime, uh, JFK, excuse me, JFK, LBJ, starts Operation Rolling Thunder where they drop uh, three years, they drop six million tons of bombs on the Vietnamese jungle and they wiped out a lot of foliage. In the meantime, LeMay goes to work for Network Electronics, uh, and he's basically in charge of finding military contracts for this company based in Colorado. And then of course, on January 30th of 68, the Tet Offensive occurs, 
where the, uh, the Viet Cong attack every basic military facility all through Vietnam, from Saigon all the way up to the, to the uh, DMZ. And at this point in time, Johnson decides he's not going to run for election in 1968, and McNamara resigns. So in the 68 election, you had Richard Nixon, who'd been defeated eight years prior to, by JFK, and you had Hubert Humphrey, who was uh, Johnson's vice president, and then George Wallace jumped in there, the governor of Alabama and a segregationist, decides he's going to run with the American Independent Party. Well, Wallace chose LeMay as his running mate uh, to have somewhat of a military standing uh, for his campaign. And then this is the famous speech where LeMay says he would bomb North Vietnam back to the Stone Age. And you can see the expression that Wallace has there when he says it. It's priceless. So immediately he becomes a warmonger for all the hippies throughout the country. And they make up bombs away LeMay t-shirts and uh, make all kinds of signs and march on here, there, and everywhere else protesting LeMay. Well, they actually won over 13% of the vote, uh, he and Wallace did, and they won five southern states. But LeMay says the only reason that he got into the race was that he did not want Hubert Humphrey, who he couldn't stand, along with uh, LBJ, to win the election. He thought Nixon might do a better job, so by running as a third party, they took enough votes away from, uh, from the Democrats that they got Nixon into office. So Possum Hansel then goes to work for GE in the Netherlands and then he retires to Hilton Head, South Carolina to write some books. Hansel passed away in 1988. LeMay passed away in 1990. They're both buried at the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. And then Frank Andrews is buried at Arlington, of course, the highest ranking uh, officer killed in World War II. Thank you very much. You've been a most attentive audience. Any questions? Any questions I can answer? <laughs>